I'm Nick Zeppos, Chancellor of Vanderbilt University. Welcome to the Zeppos Report, a podcast where I get to talk with the people shaping and helping us understand our world. My guest today, I am very pleased to say, is the legendary filmmaker Ken Burns. It's commencement week at Vanderbilt, and Ken today was presented with the Nichols Chancellor Medal, one of Vanderbilt's highest honors before speaking at our senior day. He graduated from Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts in 1975, and he hasn't stopped making films since. He burst into American culture in 1990 with his nine-part series, The Civil War, which is still the single highest rated and most celebrated documentary in public television history. Always Ken has more work to do than time to do it, and if you say you're almost done, it's probably time to stop. But um, you were here talking to our wonderful graduates, reflecting back on your career and uh, giving a, a marvelous talk. But how did you enter the film documentary business, and how did you end up making your first film on the Brooklyn Bridge? So, I, I in, first of all, thank you for having me. I, I entered this world um, in tragedy. Uh, my mom was dying of cancer. She died when I was 11 years old. And thereafter, my father had a fairly strict curfew for me and my younger brother. But he forgave it for me if it was a school night and we were staying up till 1 a.m. to watch an old movie. Or he'd take me out to the Cinema Guild. Or we'd look at a first-run French New Wave film or go back and see a, an old silent film. And I saw my dad cry for the first time. Didn't cry when my mom was sick, when she died mm. at the funeral. People noticed that. I had noticed it, but we're sort of all, you know, stunned. But there was my father looking at Odd Man Out by Sir Carol Reed about the Irish Troubles, starring James Mason. And he started to cry. And I instantaneously, age 12, a few months after my mom died, I realized I want to be a filmmaker. I understood that it provided an emotional safe haven for him. So that meant becoming a Hollywood filmmaker. That meant being John Ford or Alfred Hitchcock. But I ended up at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, a new experimental school. And all of my teachers were social documentary still photographers and filmmakers who reminded me quite correctly that there is as much drama in what is and what was as anything the human imagination dreams of. So all of a sudden, by 12, I know what my profession is. By 19, I know that it's going to be documentary. By the time I'm done with Hampshire, I, the, my senior thesis, its not they don't have seniors and they don't have thesis, but the film that I made there to graduate was on um, Old Sturbridge Village, a living history museum like Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia. And it was dealing with history, which is completely untrained and untutored in me. So... I started a film company with fellow graduates called Florentine Films, and I had, was suffering from pneumonia, and a friend of mine was a, um, and a, a book salesman. My best friend was a book salesman. One day he came into my bedroom and threw down on the bed in my apartment uh, this book, a paperback edition of David McCullough's The Great Bridge, The Epic Story of the Building of the Brooklyn Bridge. And I read it in one gulp, and I walked out in my pajamas and bathroom <laughs> to my partners, and I said, this is our film. This is our first. And they thought I was crazy. But I wanted to do a thing. I wanted to have not just a third-person narrator, but a, but a chorus of first-person voices that would bring the letters and the diaries and the journals to life, the newspaper reports, the engineering reports. I wanted to take photographs and not film them at arm's length, but treat them the way a, a feature filmmaker would with a master shot, a wide, a medium, a close, a tilt, a pan, a reveal, inserts of that, and breathe life in it. Not just, you know, trust that photograph not to be a static representation, but to be a representation of something that had had a past and would have a future after the click that was made way back in 1869 or 1883, the, the age span of the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge, and then to listen to the photographs, to do as complex a sound effects track that would make it come alive. And born then was what I called an, uh, an emotional archaeology, that I wasn't interested in the excavation of dry dates and facts and events, but something was higher. And I, and I want to get the, the term straight, and I tried to explain it to the students this morning, which is when you say emotional, people sort of tense up, because particularly in the academy, that means sentimentality or nostalgia, which is the enemy of good anything. But we tend to retreat to a rational world where one and one always equals two. What we look at when we step back from our lives, either in our faith, in our relationships, in our art, whatever it is, is we want one and one to equal three. We always say it was great because the whole was greater than the sum of the parts. So if the sum of the parts come up to here and the whole is actually up there, 
what is that difference? And that difference may be faith in one context. It may be the exhilaration of knowledge in another. It may be the ecstasy of relationship uh, or, or lo what we call love, or it may be art. And that's what I was trying to get out of this thing. So my, fa ex my, my late father-in-law said to me, uh, at one time that I woke the dead, that that's what I did for a living, that I, here was this little boy <laughs> who wanted his mom to come back and oh. I could make Abraham Lincoln and Jackie Robinson and Louis Armstrong come alive. Who do you think you're really trying to wake up? So in a way, what, I, what happened in that moment with my dad was I decided I would wake the dead for the rest of my life. Well, you've, you've brought so much life to your characters in American history and the American story. How much of the Brooklyn Bridge project got you interested in America? Because you're 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 kind of in many ways a different sort, but your films are to film what Aaron Copeland is to classical music. music. Absolutely. So and I, so how how was it a window or no, only in retrospect no, does it I, look like an American project? I have I mean, let's just be honest. I am provincial. I am parochial. My <laughs> parochial. I I do my films in American history, and I make the same film over and over again. I'm just trying to figure out who we are, and each film is an uh, is an exploration of a uh, the deepening of a question, the sounding of a question. The answer is, in some ways, not irrelevant. The answer is the answer, but you're never going to get it. You're, what you're going to get are good questions, and that's what sparks things happening. But I, I can remember as a little boy even, always loving American history. I always did well in it. Um, if you ask me what I'm going to be, it would be an anthropologist or a, you know, a writer or a filmmaker at various stages, never a historian. But I... I had it, and what was so fortunate is that if I know at 12 I'm going to be a filmmaker, at 19 I'm going to be documentary, at 22 it's going to be in American history, that is just focusing. And that, I feel like I have the best job in the country. It educates all my parts, and each time I dive into something wholeheartedly and the best sense of that word. And what we forget, as Faulkner reminds us, is history is not was but is, that History is the set of questions we in the present ask of the past. And so it's literally trying to find out some stuff. What happened on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania in 1863? Well, you know, we know what happened. But the way we ask those questions is very much informed, however consciously or subconsciously, by our own anxieties, our own dreams, our own fears, our own wishes. And so history becomes very much not just of the the past and the present, but also of the future. And I love that kind of collapse of time. Time's a kind of arbitrary human superimposition. Uh, and 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 we 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 barely even understand it. So I've spent my life telling stories, and history is mostly made up of the word story plus high, which is a good mm -hmm. way to, to to start a conversation. And uh, it's just sort of finding in these past, seemingly past moments, things that resonate in the future. And as I was trying to explain to the graduating students and their and their parents today that that we 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 like to say the history repeats itself. It's a kind of an easy thing. We we say we're condemned to repeat what we don't remember. But in point of fact, the only thing that's constant is human nature that superimposes itself over what is the seemingly random chaos of events. And I say seemingly because I don't know if we humans yet have a consciousness that see, that might actually perceive patterns. Let's remember one of the greatest understandings. I was talking to some of your graduates afterwards, and they were asking, peppering me with questions about history. I said, listen, they, they liked the fact that I could, that I could, that I went into the intimate as well as the general. And I said, well, you know, the best way to tell the general is to be intimate, and the best way to understand the intimate is that it's universal. So another way to say that is always remember that the architecture of the atom is the architecture of the solar system. Mm. And that is sort of what I do for a living, is it, it's just sort of finding in, say, the Roosevelts, familiarities that are they're common to all of us, and yet they possess extraordinary greatness, which has a way of leveling greatness. There's no communication in this world except among equals. So as soon as we make somebody bold-faced, we return to the, to the monarchy that we supposedly shed more than 200 years ago. And if you look down at someone, you are at the heart of the, of the malevolent despotism that has bedeviled humanity from the beginning. There is only one 
answer, which is a democratic equality in which I look at you eye to eye, and whatever you say, whether you're the graduating student and I'm the class day speaker or whatever it is, we are the same, yeah, I think, period. Yeah, I was out uh, at the reception and I had a young graduate of great promise and very humble background. And I, she was graduating from the engineering school with all these honors and her whole family, three generations there. And I called over the chair of the board of trust. And I said, you know, I want you to meet her. Because, and I said, that could be you one day. You bet. Don't, he was an engineering graduate. Yes. Finding his way. I found uh, also, um, you know, kind of almost in your talk, um, let me put it this way, I, I've taught constitutional law for decades, and I practice in the area, and I now get asked by my students, you know, what are the, what's the most important part of the Constitution? And, you know, I would, in my earlier days, I would be, well, the Equal Protection Clause, the Due Process Clause, the 13th Amendment, and I finally said, we the people. Yeah. And that's kind of your project about the past and the future, which is you're trying to tell stories because you're connecting us, you're interrogating that past in the way Twain said for the future. That's right. So it's, it's interesting. You know, the Declaration is, for the most part, poetry followed by complaint ending with poetry. The Constitution is four pieces of parchment written at the end of the 18th century that's able to adjudicate our most of our most complicated problems in this, the new 21st century. And except for the preamble, which is extremely short, it's all kind of mechanical stuff. And the amendments are all sort of updates. It'd be like downloading the, the newest mm -hmm. update of what it is. And some of them are expanding rights, and those are the important ones. And one of them limits rights, prohibition, and that failed. And that got rid of it. And the rest are kind of mechanical. This is what we do about succession. This is what we do yeah. about this. This is what we when, do about when that. When does the president's term end? But, yeah. but embodied in the aspirational aspect of the, of the preamble is is exactly where all of us lie, because a lot of people try to re return to the nuts and bolts of the mechanics of the Constitution to hide a lot of stuff that the Declaration has. But in the preamble, you just can't get away from a more perfect union yeah. or, or provide for welfare uh, or right. all of these sorts of things. It means that we're bound up together. And I had cited a comment that the late uh, historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr. had said about multiculturalism, and he said there's too much pluribus and not enough unum, and oh, I've that expanded that because I think that we now live in a society in which our electronics, our devices, have rendered us kind of all lonely, independent, free agents. And we don't want to be free agents. We want to be connected to community. That's, I mean, that's what a commencement or a class day thing is event. We like to sing in church. We like to sing the national anthem at a ballpark. We like to do things together, but almost everything in our, in, in the rest of the world drives us apart from each other. And in, and in all of that, we then begin in thinking that we need to be in defensive postures with the rest of us begin to make everything a binary computer thing. The way our devices work is the way we think everything works. So you're a red state person or you're or a blue state person. You're wrong or you're right. right. You're black or you're white. You're gay. You're straight. You're male or female. You're rich or poor. You're from the north or the south or the east or the west. And suddenly we have these distinctions. We forget to select for the fact that almost 99% of what we have is in common. And so the films that I've made have been an attempt just to tell the story. But I know that the bi one of the byproducts of it is a very difficult four-letter word that you're not supposed to say, which is love. Oh, I, I think and that, to me, is the operating principle of the important. universe. And I, I think we forget that that's behind that. It's what everybody wants, and yet it's so much easier to literally devolve to these... Um, to hide behind the ramparts, uh, either the physical ones or the imaginary ones that protect us, the gated communities that keep the other out, the borders, the walls that keep the other out, though our strength has been in the in the natural alloy the America, America is. I mean, a, a metal, an alloy is much stronger than its constituent parts because of the blending of that. And why would we ever sort of think that now there was a time to blow a whistle and say, we're not going to strengthen this ally. Let me. Uh, you spent um, quite a bit of time, um, appropriately, on Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, 
Eleanor Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, and two very different people, or four very different people from very different stock, yep. very different narratives, um, very different genealogies. Um, did they have that quality of love? You know, when you were reading the poetry from Lincoln's speech, is that what you found as you went very personal with them to the more general historical? Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. I might refine that a little bit and say that maybe love is the byproduct of the collision of the free electrons of all of our struggles, you know? So it's different in TR. He may be the least yeah. lovable, even though he seems the most lovable because of his personality, but he's he's so driven. He's so trying to escape the devils. He said, black care can rarely catch up with a rider whose pace is fast enough, meaning you can um, outrun your demons. Your yeah. And he, whenever he paused, he, they overtook him like a blackness that you, you couldn't believe it, like Mordor in The Lord of the Rings sort of <laughs> taking Frodo and sort of taking him over. And so he always had to be in perpetual motion. And, he, and, and there's many terrible prices to pay for that. But Eleanor, beset by some of the worst possible things, and Lincoln, and, and are, are just, they seem to be all about service and about love. And then Franklin is, to me, in some ways, the most unusual. I'm a Lincoln guy, and so I just assume that, you know, when you have a discussion of the presidents, it's all besides George Washington, because without Washington, his personality, his example, we wouldn't be here. So then you rate it, and it's obviously Abraham Lincoln. And then I I think everybody who's not trying to be just, you know, knee-jerk political would put Franklin Roosevelt next. He came up to parody with Lincoln as a result, because if you think about this guy, obviously Patricia stock like his fifth cousin uh, uh, Theodore and and his wife Eleanor uh, pampered only son liberated from a great deal of tragedy in his life the death of his father is is an important moment but really protected and then is hit with infantile paralysis and George will said something in our film he said when the steel went on his legs it went in his soul, too, in a good way. I mean, yeah. it steeled him to be able to do something. And the kind of empathy that he was able to develop for people who were not like him, in the same way that Teddy Roosevelt had taken his grief at the loss of his mother and his wife at the same day in the same house, uh, February 14th, 1884, and gone out west, and this Harvard force bespeckled, yeah. you know, Harvard guy with a funny... Eastern accent is now welcomed by the cowboys. They make fun of him for a while and the ranchers, but he proves his own mettle and remained resolutely himself is exactly, Franklin does the same thing. He never pretended he was anything but Franklin Roosevelt, but he knew, you know. Um, somebody said uh, during the Depression that Franklin Roosevelt is the only man that knows my boss is a son of a bitch. <laughs> right? And it just, yeah. and, 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 there was a sense that when they raided the most people, Franklin Roosevelt, in the middle of the Depression, Franklin Roosevelt was number one, and God was a distant second. Wow. And the sense of paternalism, which is such a dirty word today, yeah. and understandably so, yeah. and so abused, could be so generously done. And then have a wife who is ahead of the curve, ahead of him. It was said, Stuart Udall said to America, head of decades. America, everything. Stuart Udall, in an interview for our National Parks film, said that Teddy Roosevelt had distance in his eyes. He could see around, like he could see around the curve of the earth, and he knew what was going to happen. I think Eleanor had it too. And so, her father died a horrible, hopeless alcoholic. Many of her uncles and relatives were alcoholic. So she was right on every issue, but prohibition. But you can give her a pass <laughs> because she had seen the ravages of of alcoholism, Alcohol. and you could say. You know, her initial support for prohibition was, but, but, you know, the first thing her husband does. The first, first thing, thing her yeah. husband does is yeah. bring back the beer. Yeah. yeah. What, um, I think you do a great job of, you know, pointing out that, you know, history is just not this machine that moves forward and that human agency and human action are all interacting with circumstances that's correct and you know i think you look you look at you know abraham lincoln you say well 
or FDR was there, all right, the circumstances made him great, but yet you still have a James Buchanan. Yes, you do. And yes, did you, you become convinced that leadership really matters because it is on the razor's edge between a Buchanan and a Lincoln? Yeah, two, 15th president and 16th president. Arguably the worst president and arguably the best president. And we spoke about this earlier. The cataclysm of World War II, which killed 60 million people, rocked humanity to its soul, whether it was aware of it or not. And everything was challenged. And one of the things that got challenged legitimately was narrative, which was a bankrupt old white man, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, American history was only a succession of presidential administrations punctuated by wars. That was it. And it was replaced by a desperation to find some new operating system that would do it. And would Freudianism, would the, really the, mm-hmm. the ego and the id and the superego and these repressed sexual things, would that be the way to explain us? Yeah, sure, that's really great. Or would an economic or mm-hmm. Marxist, Marxist term, a deconstruction or sy- a symbolism or semiotics or uh, queer studies or Afrocentrism or feminism, all of these things became the fashions of historiography for generations and, and traded off, and they were limited. But it was a necessary revolution to overthrow the old narrative only to discover you needed to go back to telling stories. Honey, how was your day does not begin, I backed slowly down the driveway to avoid the garbage can at the curb. (laughs) You never say that unless somebody T-bones you at that moment. Um, So we, we human beings, in order to, in some ways, try to escape the specific gravity of our mortality, i.e. none of us are getting out of this alive, tell stories to one another. And how we tell stories... And the systems we use, the Aristotelian poetics, is the basically the way to do it. And even those people who were overthrowing traditional narrative still had to communicate that in Aristotelian fashions. You know, beginning, middle, and end, protagonist, right. antagonist, climax, denouement, all that sort of stuff, character built. That's all been there from the beginning, and that's what human beings do. But I think it was a necessary thing that permitted us to go back and understand, yes, just when you think it's all about the insertion of, an, of the great man, the individual, the Lincoln, as opposed to the Buchanan, we can understand that there are some mechanistic aspects sure. to history that just happened that may be economic, that may be Freudian, that may be some other thing that we're not even aware of. Economic is a, is a pretty legitimate thing. The money is such a compelling force in the world that people won't admit that um, you, you can be, it can be the governor on your engine. And at the same time, what you realize that you're drawn to are those moments when what seeps out are, is, is a Franklin Roosevelt, is an Eleanor, is an Abraham Lincoln, is often the, the type of stories that we like to tell that are also bottom up, where you, you know, we made a film on World War II and we just finished one on, on uh, Vietnam and we consciously had no famous historians, n- most of the people you didn't know. And you know, we, our tagline was, it, there are no ordinary people, and there aren't. Mm-hmm. There are not. Uh, and, 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 and even James Buchanan is not an ordinary All person. Right. You know? right. What, um, as you move through so many different uh, eras and so many different personalities, have you just said, I'm going to be agnostic on who my real heroes are? Obviously, Lincoln and FDR are very much in your mind. Others that have come to you to say, not perfect, I'm going to tell the story, but really an extraordinary no. hero of mine. Any others? Thousands. And some of them are people wow. you've never heard of because we've just met them in Vietnam and I'll introduce you to a Marine or an Army guy or a North Vietnamese general or you know a, a South Vietnamese Marine, one of the bravest men I've ever met, and his testimony is, is so compelling. You know, and even the Lincolns uh, you know, have incredible flaws. You know? And it isn't just his own susceptibility to depression. I mean, he's tardy on emancipation. Right. And he thinks even in April of 61 that maybe we can colonize all African Americans back to Mm -hmm. Africa or to South America. Let's just get them out of the way. It's a terrible problem, you know? And it's only later that that he begins to evolve. And same with Franklin Roosevelt. He has a kind of deviousness that is shocking to his wife and to his closest associates. And uh, and yet, you know, and yet he's Franklin Roosevelt. So I, I think what it is is that we're agnostic in in 
in trying to sort of liberate ourselves from whatever preconceptions or, or conventional wisdom we're bringing, to try to see, to uh, psychoanalyze ourselves as we go into a Vietnam or a, a Roosevelt's, to sort of fr try to free ourselves from that. Because if we start to tell you what you should know, that's homework, mm -hmm. right? But if we share with you a process of discovery, that's something else. That's the essence of a story, right? Somebody once told me that good history was, you know, you... Uh, staying with it even though you know the way it's going to turn out. So you go to Ford's Theater thinking maybe this time the gun will jam. Yeah. And <laughs> that, but you know it's you know not going to jam. Right. But, it, but that's, what I, that's what you want to help have happen. And, and I, I like that aspect of history, and I like the delving into it. And then it permits the heroism to uh, bubble up from any kind of place, the leadership and its examples uh, to be from any corner. Uh, I mean, just the bravery of a gold star mother in our Vietnam film just the willingness to actually sit down. She did not have to do this, yeah. to sit down with the documentary film crew and say, this is who he was, this is what he did, this is what happened the day that he did this, this is what happened when the two guys walked up the steps to tell me, you know? Didn't have to go through that. Did the, did the Vietnam movie coming kind of at this point in your career become a very different movie than if you had done it 10 years ago, or is the change in the country? So it's, how, how do you think? Because a lot of times you're moving <laughs> movies back and forth for logistical <laughs> and other reasons as opposed to this vine is not ready to ripen. How is it a different movie? So we started the Vietnam film more than 10 years ago. Yeah. So Barack Obama had not announced his candidacy for president, wow. let alone serve two terms, and then Donald Trump is now president. And yet, if I hadn't told you I was working on a film for 10 years about Vietnam, but said, listen, I've been working on a film for 10 years about mass demonstrations across the country, about a White House in disarray, about a White House obsessed with leaks to the press, about huge document drops, uh, dumps mm -hmm. into the public of, of important government documents, about asymmetrical warfare that we don't seem to have any idea about how to counteract, you would say, Ken, my goodness, yeah. you've abandoned uh, yeah. history, you're doing the yeah, contemporary you're on the moment. News. But you know what? That was also the case back 10 years ago as well. It just has a resonance, and I've been so fortunate in my professional life that I've released films that have been taught. I mean, I worked for four years uh, you know, in the vineyards on an 18 and a half hour film about baseball, which I told people was the sequel to the Civil War, and they looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> and it comes out in September of 1994 when, guess what? There's no baseball. Yeah, I was going to say. There's that's a the, strike. Yeah, there's a strike And so here. all of a sudden people go, how did you know? Yeah. Did you yeah. plan this? And <laughs> there was seemed to be, at every time, the national parks, uh, the World War II, you know, just on the cusp where we really had begun to lose, you know, almost flattening the number of veterans yeah. that are around. And it just was an important time to do these things. So this is the right time to do it. I think with regard to Vietnam, the more operative thing that Lynn Novick, who's the co-director with me and I, feels that our... We needed our chops uh, to be at the highest level that we mm -hmm. could possibly. So I couldn't have done it earlier. I'm not sure we'd want to do it. Something happened during Vietnam. Something metastasized. We caught some virus. And the kind of disunion that we experience today had its seeds there. As one of our Army guys says, Vietnam drove a stake through the heart of America, and I don't think we've recovered. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the case, would it be possible now with all the new scholarship, with a kind of view of looking at it not from the dialectic, but be able to understand, Winton said something in jazz to me, he said, sometimes a true, a thing, sometimes a thing in the opposite of a thing can be true at the same time. Mm -hmm. So what if you could create a space in which multiple truths and perspectives could obtain, and you could, you could just understand that that's, that that's life, that maybe you could unpack all of that stuff from Vietnam, that maybe we could agree that stuff happened and that it might be possible in that unpacking to pull some of the fuel rods out of this anger that seems to continually mm. grow in us. And we, you know, we're, we're, we're saying things to each other we should not be saying in a democracy, that, that the binary partisanship has overtaken even the institutions of, say, the Senate or the House or the, how people conduct themselves uh, it, with regard to the judiciary. All of a sudden, if you don't like a ruling, it's the problem with the judge, judge not right. the fact 
that law is behind all these things. It's right. the heritage of the judge, right. or it's it's the person was a de- clearly a Democrat or right. uh, clearly a Republican. And so what we've tried to do with Vietnam is be umpires, calling balls and strikes. Yeah. And so this is the story of five American presidents, Truman and Eisenhower and Kennedy and Johnson, particularly Johnson and Nixon, to a lesser extent Ford, all of whom made critical decisions about the war, foreign policy, in a, around the world based on domestic political considerations, which is a very fancy way of saying, am I going to get reelected? Right. And it was easier to muddle through and permit people to continue dying on our side and their side, millions on their side, three millions on their side, mm-hmm. and more than 58,000 on our side, than it was to confront uh, a reality of foreign policy, that this was not the legitimate place for a proxy war, and no one could do that. And we don't have to go in and say, this person was wrong or that person mm-hmm. was wrong. We can listen to their tape, and you can decide. Right. You can you can read the document, and you can decide. Or you can talk to a soldier who still thinks that we should be there fighting the commies, or talk to somebody you knew from the beginning who was wrong, or talk to a soldier who fights and comes home and is angry at the protesters and then tries to argue with them and doesn't have an argument, and all of a sudden changes. And all of those people and many more, there are 150 people you'll meet, some archivally, but, you know, 100 of them in the flesh. And they're not a, not a single one. I mean, our Vietnamese soldiers, the North Vietnamese soldiers, don't agree with one another. Mm-hmm. Our Viet Cong guys don't agree with themselves, nor do our civilian, Sa- Sa- Saigon civilians or the North Vietnamese civilians. And of course, the Americans have every possible point of view as possible. But what if you just said, okay, that's what it is. Right. Accept it. Right. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about your uh, country music yeah. documentary that's coming up. And how did that project kind of first enter your mind and your group as a seed? What was the seed planted there? Well, it's it's a perfect project for me. Um, I mean, it does, it's firing on all cylinders of the kinds of things I want to do about asking who we are as a people. But in 2010, I was visiting a friend in Texas who's been helping me raise money. We have a group called the Better Angel Society after Abraham Lincoln's uh, first inaugural when he's appealing to the better angels of our nature. And we were padding around at breakfast time uh, after an evening, you know, of, of talking to folks in Dallas. And he said, do you ever think about country music? And it just, it <laughs> like, he could have knocked me over with a feather. And I went back to my co-producer and the writer, Dayton Duncan, and he was struggling with another project that we hadn't started, but we were just trying to figure out how conceptually we were going to get a hold on it. It was going to be a major thing that followed Vietnam, and we were already working on Vietnam. And I said, how about country music? I said, you don't have to get rid of the other thing. And he goes, no, fine. And like, it was that instantaneous thing. And, and think about it, right? We began this five years ago. We didn't know where we'd be, the kind of angry uh, reaction of uh, white men uh, to a a, a sense of of always being on the outs of the political dynamic. And uh, yet, what is country music at its heart? Is people who feel like their stories haven't been told having their stories told very simply, very elementary, not big stuff, but regular stuff. You know, I fell in love with this person. I lost my job. We had babies. I can't afford to pay for these education. Why We're breaking up. She died, right? I mean, this is what it is. And we can go on and joke about dogs and beer and pickup trucks, but it's really elemental human stuff that happens to all of us. And it addresses it when it's good as well as anything. And so it's another way of taking on the 20th century. You know, I like to tell people, think about the 1920s, what comes to mind? And, you know, people say the jazz age, people say, you know, uh, flappers, or they say, you know, gangsters with the machine gun. So I've been through the 20s in about half the films I've made. Mm -hmm. And the 20s I go through in the Roosevelts, in the Dust Bowl, in baseball, in jazz, it's so different from one another. Yes, they have flappers, and yes, they have gangsters, and yes, they have hard times, and yes, they have this. But it's so different that it just tells you that that kind of conventional wisdom, the cliche that we have in our head, belies what really happens. And 
what are the 20s anyway? They're completely arbitrary. Mm -hmm. The Depression starts in 29, so it's really the 30s is the Depression. But by, you know, the Depression doesn't really end until full mobilization of World War II, so it's 42. So it's really hard to do that. And and the 40s are this bifurcated decade, right. which has, you know, four and a half years of war and then not war. Um, and... You know, so it's it's and just post-war again, normalization. and we say the '50s was a certain way, but yeah. it's really uh, we we do this. You know, you can put your your goalposts wherever you want to put right. your goalposts, right. but what they are are arbitrary human superimpositions on what is random chaos or seemingly random chaos, which we're trying to make sense of. Yeah. And there, you could easily say, well, the 20th century. Well, even then, when did the 20th century begin? Was it really 1894 that it began? Right. Or maybe it was 1893 when Frederick Jackson Turner right, wrote his wrote celebrated essay thesis. that the frontier was closed. So right. maybe that's the 20th yeah. century. Or yeah. maybe it was something else. Or maybe it wasn't until World War I right. and the enormous carnage from that. You know, so, so when does the Renaissance begin? And, and then we have to go back and go, well, whose time system are we on yeah. anyway? And, and who why are invented we this century? It? And why, you know, so what happens is, is that you get down when you escape the specific gravity of some of these constraints, they're helpful structural devices, scaffolding and false work that keep the building up. But, but once you're done, once you're telling a story, it's all the intimacy of the moment who that person is, the twitch in their cheek if it's a gold star mother. It's the guy saying, you know, I, I, I went up the hill in Vietnam alone. I thought I was there for a week, and it probably was only three seconds, and I looked, and these kids were following me up the hill. Mm -hmm. You know, and I know what it means for three seconds to feel like a week, right? What... Uh how much is Nashville a character uh, na in the in the? I have to ask because it's it's all it's 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 uh, where our great university is, and we call it the It City. And how much is Nashville it's, a character? It's a huge character. Um, it is you know one of these wonderful accidental things. If there hadn't been this insurance company right. that bought a you know, a radio station that was a lost leader just to get people to spread the word about their policies. And they put on lots of different shows and classical music and didn't, had a barn dance, but so did Chicago have a barn dance and Charlotte had a barn dance and Indianapolis had a barn dance and Dallas had a barn dance. And some of those had bigger radio signals, but this one was sort of centrally located and, and they suddenly changed the name accidentally one night to the Grand Ole Opry because they just, somebody said, you've just left the Grand Ole Old opera, and the guy who was inheriting the barn dance show said, and now, you know, that now it's the Grand Old Opry, and that became it. It was also um, a place where uh, songwriters and recording started to happen, and all roads seemed to accidentally lead uh, to Nashville. And lots of tributaries came in from Texas, the Central right. Valley of, of uh, California, and of course from Appalachia, uh, of which Tennessee has a, a claim to. And uh, it's it's just one of those wonderful things. And also, you have to understand, and Vanderbilt is part of that story, that this was the Athens of the South. Right. And there was nothing pleasant, even though the people fr who ran the insurance company in WSM were in Bellmead. Um, they were not terrifically thrilled with the idea that this is where all the hillbillies were trying to come to and right. where people were making pilgrimages. So there's a wonderful person, Sarah Ophelia Cannon, who mm -hmm. bridges it. She's Minnie Pearl, but she's to the manor born. She's well brought up. She's got a, a great education, and yet she feels for the ordinary people and helps to translate. And And I think because uh, the country music has been so phenomenally successful financially, it's hard now right. to sort of ignore the fact uh, that it's not only the Athens of the South, but also Music City USA, or It City. Yeah. Well, um, just last question. And I know you're juggling a lot of projects. What else is in store on that long list of projects, Can and Well, we have to plan far out. It's all for public broadcasting. None of these films would be possible without public broadcasting. There's not a marketplace thing that would be able to spend the 10 years that we spend and the amount of money we spent on Vietnam or what we're doing with country music. You just have to do, uh, it's more like an academic situation, which has one foot in the marketplace, but the other proudly out of it, and that's public broadcasting. So well, uh, the economies of scale that come from long-range planning really assist. And so we're doing a biography of Ernest Hemingway. We're about halfway done wow. with the 
pre-production on that. We've done 10 or 12 interviews. We're embedded in a prison in upstate New York looking at mass incarceration and the education of prisoners. Um, we're doing a history of crime and punishment across the whole United States. We're doing LBJ and civil rights. We're doing a biography of, of uh, Benjamin Franklin. We're going to do a history of the American Revolution. Uh, I have some incredibly beautiful graphic maps that in Vietnam that I had one of these revelations. They came back from the guy who designed them, and you're coming th out of clouds into the Adrang Valley and the Chupong Massif, where the famous battles with Hal Moore's uh, group were happening at Landing Zone X-Ray. And I went, now I can tell the revolution. I don't have to do re stupid reenactments with <laughs> blue coats and red coats. I can swoop down Long Island yeah. and see uh, the retreat from Brooklyn yeah. Heights and see the retreat up to Harlem and see the retreat to White Plains. And then all of a sudden, it isn't just Lexington and Concord. And then all of a sudden, the surrender at Yorktown. And I don't know. And well, oh, yeah, he did oh. cross the Delaware in, in Christmas and Trenton. So, But to, to organically be able to communicate without doing a lot of you know, green felt tables and white quill pens and to make the American Revolution come alive for the struggle that we think the photographic evidence of the Civil War helped us understand and the both photographic and, and motion picture evidence of World War II in Vietnam helped us understand those shows. So, and, and many others, the history of invention and technology. Uh, we like to do a biography of Kay Graham, of Joseph Pulitzer, of, you know, Walter Lippmann. We have lots of, uh, we're working on a, a biography right now already underway on Muhammad Ali. Wow. So, you know, if I were given a thousand years to live, which I won't, I would not run out of topics in American history. Well, let's hope you capture pretty close to that thousand years. I have to tell you that my um, wife is from Springfield, Illinois, and um, I don't know if you, you spoke to her, but um, her father was the mayor, and in the downtown plaza where they've named it after him, um, I think it's a Rachel Lindsay poem that talks about needing Lincoln-hearted men. Yes, and, we do. And we, needed, we need Lincoln-hearted men and women. And you are certainly, in my mind, a Lincoln-hearted man. Well, that man. would be the highest compliment. Thank you so could pay much me. for Thank being you. on the Zeppos Report. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.